Good morning. Before we begin our worship with the events of this week, I have a, a few words to say as your chair of council. During this past week, like all of you, your clergy and your council, we've been very busy monitoring the public health advisories. We've made the risk assessments. We've looked at our contingency plans. And yes, we're all taking precautions as we've social distanced ourselves this morning. So my message is intended really to amplify the story that underscores our discernment and decision making to have worship this morning, yet to suspend worship for the following two weeks. As he highlighted in our communique to you that went out yesterday in the life and work, and if you haven't had the opportunity to read it yet, there are some printed copies available. So to set the stage, the United Church of Canada guidance, reaffirmed by the Eastern Ottawa Udaway Region Council, to our communities of faith is that we should make our own risk assessments and decisions during this health emergency, including whether or not to meet in person and whether or not pastoral care in person should be suspended. Knowing that your clergy and council would be required to make that decision, we've been very busy discerning the ever-changing landscape. But now that we've made those decisions, we felt you'd be interested to know how we got there, especially on a morning where many of the other churches are not meeting for worship. So your COVID-19 action team members, we were ready to respond. We had, we had the emergency plans. We had the contingency plans done. They were quickly brought to a state of readiness, and we responded. Your clergy, your clergy, amplified our information by being so well connected to the Ottawa Clergy Network. And we took action. We made the things that needed to be done so we could do the regular hand washing with soap, the respiratory etiquette, <coughs> the social distancing, right? And staying at home when we were ill or at risk because we traveled. This is the current advice. What we did is everything we could and should be done. Bearing in mind, we have very limited cleaning infrastructure. By early Saturday, Saturday and as of last evening, the number of cases remained low, and we decided we could still go forward. And we don't understand why there's a need for so much toilet paper and breakfast cereal to go off the shelves, you know? So within this chaos, we reflected on the science, the spiritual role of our church to provide comfort and calm in a society, especially during this storm, and while we appreciate the omnibus decisions taken by our Anglican bishops and Catholic dioceses to suspend weekend in-person services for the next three weeks, the United Church of Canada afforded us the opportunity to make a more surgical approach in our decision making. And we accepted that responsibility and conducted a prudent analysis. Our task was not to interpret the decisions of others. We resolved that an abundance of care must be taken to ensure that no congregant would feel a sense of obligation to attend or support worship, if that was the outcome. We resolved that we must be responsible and do our part to prevent the infection and protect those at greater risk without judgment of the actions of others. We acknowledged that we should change our behaviors during this health emergency and follow public health and government advice. We assessed that while Sunday worship in normal times results in a gathering of 250, we should choose 
to stay away. Many would choose to stay away this Sunday, as you see, thereby reducing our risk, those who are here today. The Seventh-day Adventists canceled their service because they felt their group would be too large, minimizing our risk regarding cleanliness from Saturday to Sunday, a bonus. But we have limited cleaning capacity. Be aware, we do not have hand sanitizers, and they're simply not available. We've ramped up our cleanliness, but there's a limit to that. So with the heightened requirements for food preparation and handling, we've closed the kitchen to all user groups. And there is no fellowship coffee and snacks this morning. And unfortunately, our potluck at the end of the month will have to be rescheduled. Other modifications you see here, the offerings, our formal greetings, the way we're taking our bulletins, Sunday school was canceled, and well, there's no lid for the children's offering. We're following the science. There are a few cases now, but we know that number will grow. Hence the decision to suspend the next two weeks. We want to direct our energies towards what we should be doing, caring and comforting our community, our community of faith and our outreach community. We believe in worship and prayer provides comfort during unsteady times. And I am so pleased to announce that this morning we are live streaming this worship. And our clergy are planning to consolidate their resources and live stream a more collaborative worship on the following weeks. Thank you, technology. This week, we're working on call lists, encouraging everyone to be proactive by staying in touch with your faith community, as a family should. So be on the contact list, check our website, our Facebook page often, and please have a buddy to connect with. It's important. With regard to our rental groups and activity groups, they've been informed, they've been told to make their own decisions as a group, bearing in mind our limitations. So in closing, as council chair, I want to say this. I am very grateful to my colleagues on council and our clergy who were very active and worked many long hours engaging and monitoring to inform our process. They quickly set aside their plans. They have modified this morning's worship. They got the communiques out and have been guiding next steps. We are blessed and we are grateful. Thank you, Dot. Um, it has been uh, a busy past few days and we have been grateful as clergy for the support of the council executive especially and of the leadership within this congregation and uh, we know that that will continue and are blessed by that. So, in the light of all things changing, we are delighted that those of you who felt like you could be here are here, because quite frankly, it's weird to preach to an empty church. A couple of weeks ago, my sermon uh, wasn't recorded, and so I needed to come back during the week and preach it again to record it so we could put it on YouTube, and it was just weird to do it to nobody, and so we're grateful there are some of you here, and we thank you for doing that. We thank Paul for being here, and uh, we thank the choir members who are able to be here uh, for deciding that they could be here and help share in worship leadership. Um, given that we tend to work several weeks ahead in our liturgy planning, um, this whole service was planned uh, and printed uh, far before any of the uh, events of this past week came out. And so the lectionary reading that you're going to hear that Francis will share with us is the story of the woman at the well and Jesus encountering the woman at the well. And so in the worship service, you'll see that all of the printed stuff, all the invitation to worship and the printed prayers you'll hear 
themes of water flowing through the music and the prayers. You'll hear things of Jesus knowing somebody because that's what this story is about. And we decided we'd keep this liturgy because, frankly, there was just too much for us to do to try to revamp an entire liturgy. So you're getting two services for one is what you're getting. The printed stuff, you're going to have the service that we, we have around the woman at the well. The things that weren't printed, so things like the prayers of the people and our sermon today, obviously we felt the need to change focus, and so we have done that. And so we'll be focusing a little more on the events of this past week in those times. So if things feel a little disjointed, they are. And um, we know that you will be able to roll with the flow with us because um, that's what happens here at OUC is you just never know what's going to happen Sunday to Sunday. And so we are glad to be able to be together and to be worshiping and to all the people who are at home worshiping because we know that there are some who are joining in right now uh, for our live stream. We are glad that they are with us as well. Our hope in uh, canceling children's programs was that children would stay home today um, as so that they remain safe and so that we remain safe. And so I'm, I'm happy that that has happened. But I'm also aware that we have some children who are watching us currently online and that there is a time for all of us to experience our faith through a child's eyes. And so we will continue uh, with our children's time. And uh, what I chose for this is a book that I thought perhaps might uh, speak to all of us at a time like this um, when it's easy for us to wonder if God is actually listening to our prayers. And so the book is called How Does God Listen? If it seems familiar, it's a series that uh, I have used before, and this actual book I looked back and I shared it with the congregation, I think about five years ago. Um, but I'm going to share it again with you and we'll invite some um, feedback from you as we read through. And so you know how enthusiastic the children are in uh, sharing their responses. And so I expect equal enthusiasm from you, please. So the book is called, How Does God Listen? When I talk to God, is God listening to me? Of course, my precious one, God is always listening to you. How do I know that God is listening? I can't see God. Well, there are lots of things we can't see, yet we know they are there. Think about the wind. Can you see the wind? No. How do you know the wind is there? I can see the leaves and branches moving in the trees. God is like that too. Even though we can't see God, there are many signs that God is listening to us. These signs come to us in all kinds of ways, through what we touch, hear, see, taste, smell, and feel. We know God is listening when we feel the touch of water on our bodies, sunshine on our faces, snow on our tongues, or hugs and kisses from our moms and dads. Are there other ways that you experience God through touch? You got it. Cuddles from your family. Your head hitting the pillow. Amen. <laughs> Indeed. We know God is listening when we hear the whistle of a train carrying family and friends, the siren of a fire truck, the purring of a cat. I know that speaks to you, Joan Brocklebank. Or mommy's goodnight whisper before we fall asleep. Are there sounds that you remind you that God is present? I know that when Stephen hears church bells going wherever we are, he pauses for a minute and that's his God sound. Are there other God sounds for you? Music. Music children laughing. Birds singing. Oh, we're going to hear that soon. I can't wait. The oven dings when the cookies are done. <laughs> Indeed, Gord. We know God is listening when we see a spider web sparkling in the sunlight, the bright colors of a rainbow, red and yellow leaves in the fall, or birds flying in the sky. Are there things that you see that remind you that God is around? Mm, sunrise and sunset. When the cardinals come, especially. Mm -hmm. Stars, yes. 
We know God is listening when we taste crunchy popcorn, cold ice cream, whipped cream and hot chocolate, or the sweet and sour of lemonade. What are the tastes that remind you that God is present? Maple syrup, perhaps? Chocolate. Foamy lattes, yes. Potato chips. <laughs> we know God is listening when we smell cookies baking, the odor of a skunk, the scent of perfume, or roses in the garden. I know that my God smell is lilacs and lily of the valley, those two flowers that are here for just such short periods of time but are so beautiful. Those are smells of God to me. What are other God smells for you? Vanilla. Yes, vanilla, because it means that good things are coming. Mm -hmm. The smell of spring, that kind of muddy, wet um, promise of something coming. Pardon me? There's worms in the mud. <laughs> Coffee. <laughs> Coffee. We know God is listening when we feel our hearts beating, happiness and laughter, sadness and tears, or scared and alone. Oh, now I understand. We know how God listens to us just like we know that God loves us. Yes, love is something we cannot see, and yet we know it's there. God loves me all the time, so God is listening to me all the time, even when I'm not talking to God. Yes, God is always listening. Let's hold on to that thought in the weeks to come.
please join me in a prayer for illumination. Holy God, we are open and our spirits are willing to receive your grace. Clear the clutter and the chaos as we open our hearts to your word. Help let us go of all that holds us back from your living water. Come and fill us up so that we may never thirst again. We ask it in the name of the one who calls us beloved. Amen. Uh, today's reading is from John chapter 4, verses 5 to 42, the message. Jesus came into Sychar, a Samaritan village that bordered the field Jacob had given his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was still there. Jesus, worn out by the trip, sat down at the well. It was noon. A woman, a Samaritan, came to draw water. Jesus said, would you give me a drink of water? The Samaritan woman, taken aback, asked, how come you, a Jew, are asking me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? Jesus answered, if you knew the generosity of God and who I am, you would be asking me for a drink and I would give you fresh, living water. The woman said, Sir, you don't even have a bucket to draw with, and this well is deep. So how are you going to get this living water? Are you a better man than our ancestor Jacob, who dug this well and drank from it? He and his sons and livestock and passed it down to us? Jesus said, Everyone who drinks this water will get thirsty again and again. Anyone who drinks the water I give will never thirst, not ever. The water I give will be an artesian spring within, gushing fountains of endless life. The woman said, Sir, give me this water so I won't ever get thirsty, won't ever have to come back to this well again. And Jesus talked with the woman, revealing that he understood the harsh realities of her life and sharing with her that he was the Messiah. When his disciples came back, they were shocked. They couldn't believe he was talking with that kind of a woman. No one said what they were all thinking, but their faces showed it. The woman took the hint and left. In her confusion, she left her water pot. Back in the village, she told the people, come, see a man who knew all about the things I did, who knows me inside and out. Do you think this could be the Messiah? And they went out to see for themselves. Many of the Samaritans from the village committed themselves to him because of the woman's witness. He knew all about the things I did. He knows me inside and out. They asked him to stay, so Jesus stayed two days. A lot more people entrusted their lives to him when they heard what he had to say. They said to the woman, we're no longer taking this on your say-so. We've heard it for ourselves and know it for sure. He is the savior of the world. Holy wisdom, holy word. I remember the first Sunday after 9-11 that I had to preach. I had been a minister for just over a year at a wee, small, two-church pastoral charge north of Ottawa in rural Quebec. I had spent the week alone in my decrepit old manse, glued to the television as Stephen was stranded on the other side of the country. I had watched in horror as the events of the week unfolded. All the while, my brain churning about what it was that I might say to these dear country folk that could help them find God in the midst of a world that seemed overrun with evil. It was a defining moment in my ministry, one that made me feel the weight and the privilege of being one of God's servants in a time of great fear. I figured that every minister would have one of those moments in their ministry, and while it was a tremendous challenge, I was glad to have that moment done and over with early on. And then, almost 20 years later, 
I find myself in this moment once again, standing both in person and virtually before another beloved congregation, feeling the weight of what it means to be a pastor at a time when our world is changing hourly and we have a deep sense that life as we know it will never be the same again. I think many of you have had that feeling this past week as well as other times in your life. We can remember the moment when everything changed, be it when JFK was shot or a plane hit an office building on purpose or the world suddenly became very still as we retreated to our homes to try and slow down a virus in our midst. Even in our own lives, we have times we can think of that instant when everything changed, when a diagnosis was delivered, when a loved one breathed their last, when a dream was ripped from us, when a loss too great to imagine took hold in our life. And in these times of great upheaval, our natural, normal reaction is one of fear. Fear for the unknown future, fear of how we might be asked to change, fear of the impact the tragedy will have on our lives and the lives of those we love, fear for our world and how quickly everything we know can be thrown upside down. So I thought we might take a moment to reflect on these realities. In the next few moments, I'd invite you to open your hearts to some of those questions, those fears, those uncertainties that are swirling around within you, and to simply be still with them. To sit with them, knowing that you are not alone in your concerns or worries. Feel the presence of a faith community around you, both in person and those at home who are holding us in prayer. Trusting that God is with us even in this time of confusion and change. In this time of pause, we might even consider the impact our fears are having on us. How are we experiencing this uncertainty and worry in our bodies, in our emotions, in our relationships, in our lives? So let's be still and consider what are your greatest fears at this moment? And how are these fears impacting your life?
We offer up these fears to God now in the sanctuary of this community of faith as we pray together. Gracious God, in your loving mercy hear us, in your divine wisdom guide us, in your abiding presence comfort us, and in turn let us be comfort to a community and a world in need. All around the world, people are praying. Praying for themselves, for their children, their neighbors. Praying for safety, deliverance, for mercy, for healing. Praying in English, in French, in Italian, in Korean, in Cantonese. Praying in churches, in synagogues, in mosques, and in homes. Everywhere around the world, people are praying. Like the Israelites in the desert and like Mother Mary at the foot of her son's cross, people the world over are on their knees praying. Holy One, deliver us. Holy One, help us to care for one another. Help us to discern wisely. Help us to be the peaceful, non-anxious presence that our brothers and our sisters need right now. As we inhale your love and exhale your mercy, let us feel ourselves calming down. As we inhale your grace and exhale your love, let us bless and care for one another. Friends, take time now in these next moments to listen to your heartbeat as you do Review the past week. Let it pass in front of you like a movie. What are you most present to? Who are you most present to? Pause for a few moments of stillness. And in this moment, Listen, what is your most fervent prayer? What does your heart long to cry out to God? Offer up this prayer to God now in the sanctuary of this community of faith.
Let us gather these fervent prayers, saying together, Gracious God, in your loving mercy, hear us. In your divine wisdom, guide us. In your abiding presence, comfort us. And in turn, let us be comfort to a community and a world in need. Amen. At a time when we're being bombarded by all the things that are not happening in our world for the next few weeks, when the world feels like it might be closing in on us, I think it's important for us to find meaning and opportunity in this unexpected time. I have appreciated those who have taken the step of calling this time one of Sabbath, finding a chance many of us have to make a change in our routines, allowing us to focus our energy in other ways. No matter who we are, we will find that life will look different for us in the next few weeks. For those of us who remain working outside the home, the workplace environment will be unlike what we are used to. For those of us who will now be working from home, there will be plenty of challenges and distractions. For our children, there will be a mixture of excitement and struggle during three weeks without their normal routines. For all of us, the world around will be changed. We will see fewer people, we will interact in new ways, and the possibility for feeling lonely, isolated, and without support is very real. And yet, what I'm coming to realize if I pause long enough to remember to breathe, is that there are some amazing opportunities that are presenting themselves to us if we're willing to do a little outside of the box thinking. There is a beloved hymn we sing here at OUC, a song that the children are singing each week in Sunday school, that reminds us the church is not a building, the church is not a steeple, the church is not a resting place, the church is a people. Perhaps this is our anthem for the coming weeks, one that we need to be singing at the top of our lungs. I have already been witness to new and creative ways clergy are discussing how we might offer worship to you, our beloved flocks, in safe and meaningful ways. We look forward to digging into what might be possible, and we will keep you informed of the ways that we will be worshiping together, even if we aren't gathered here on a Sunday morning. But more than that, I have already been witness to the ways that people are connecting with God and with each other in real, meaningful, life-giving ways. People who have been reaching out to those who are vulnerable, people who have created online communities to keep in touch and share support, people who have been sharing their supplies of food and household products, even toilet paper with those who are unable to access those goods. The everyday miracles are piling up, and I anticipate a veritable avalanche of love is possible if we open our hearts to the Spirit's invitation. So in these next moments of stillness, I'd invite you to listen for that invitation to you, asking you to consider how is it that we might be the church in the weeks to come? How is it that you will connect with God personally to ensure that you can feel God's presence when you need it most? And how is it that you will help to be the hands and feet and heart of Christ, sharing God's goodness with those who are in need?
We offer up these plans for action to God now in the sanctuary of this community of faith, praying together, gracious God, in your loving mercy, hear us. In your divine wisdom, guide us. In your abiding presence, comfort us. And in turn, let us be comfort to a community and a world in need. A few weeks ago, I talked about Jesus heading into the wilderness and invited the congregation to join me in following him there. Heading to a place where things look strange and confusing, spending time in a location that is uncomfortable and that causes us to look at the hard truths of our lives. And I think that's where we found ourselves now. And much as it's a scary place to be, we people of the story know that we are not the first ones to wander out here, and certainly we are not alone. Like Moses and the Israelites wandering into uncharted territory, like Jesus being tested to live without the usual comforts of life, we can take comfort in knowing there is no place, no place we go that God does not go there with us. Paul reminded the Romans and reminds us that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. To that I might add that neither viruses nor quarantines nor toilet paper shortages, nor working from home, nor Sunday morning worship hiatus can separate us from the love of God, from the love of each other, and from the Spirit's presence equipping us to be the hands and feet of Christ in this time and this place. We will not be all together in body for the next few weeks, and maybe longer. However, we will never cease to be the church together. If there is nothing else we can hold on to, we can hold on to this. God is with us. In the weeks to come, we will be holding each other in prayer. We will be gathering virtually to worship. We will be living our faith in new ways. We will be sharing God's goodness, and we will be experiencing God's blessings. We will be held in God's loving care at this moment as we have always been and will always be in moments of change and challenge. My friends, in this defining moment in our life as a church community, I am firm in my belief that we will emerge from this wilderness time more sure of who we are and of how God has been present with us. So let us move into the coming weeks together in spirit and in heart, firm in the knowledge that in life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our moderator, the Right Reverend Richard Bott has posted a number uh, of items over the last few days. And one of these is a pastoral prayer that I have adapted slightly for this morning's celebration. In this time of pandemic, we pray. When we aren't sure, God, help us be calm. When information comes from all sides, correct and not, help us to discern. When fear makes it hard to breathe and anxiety seems to be the order of the day, slow us down, God. Help us to reach out with our hearts when we can't touch with our hands. Help us to be socially connected when we have to be socially distant. Help us to love as perfectly as we can 
knowing that perfect love casts out all fear. For the doctors, we pray. For the nurses, we pray. For the technicians and the janitors and the aides and the caregivers, we pray. For the researchers and theorists, the epidemiologists and investigators, for those who are sick and those who are grieving, we pray. For all who are affected all around the world, we pray for safety, for health, and for wholeness. And here in our community of faith, we remember those who are ill, those who have been in hospital a long time, like Peter Joyce and Bev Arnott. We remember those in our community who have had surgery, like Denny and Paul, and we pray for their full recovery and for their healing. We pray, Holy God, for the caregivers in our community, for those who care for the bodies and spirits of their loved ones. We pray, merciful God, for all those in our midst who need extra care and tenderness at this time. Help us to reach out, to extend ourselves, and to offer compassion when others suffer. At this time of worldwide crisis, may we feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked, and house those without homes. May we walk with those who feel that they are alone, and may we do all that we can to heal the sick in spite of the epidemic, in spite of the fear. Help us, O oh God, that we might help each other in the love of the Creator, in the name of the Healer, in the life of the Holy Spirit that is in all and with all. Together, we lift up our gathered prayers, the prayers of our heart, by saying together the words that Jesus taught us so long ago. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And as we go from this place to wander in the wilderness that is unknown and that is scary and that is full of possibility, we go knowing that wherever it is we are headed, God is with us, God is already there, and that we are not alone in this. And so let's go out into our wandering, asking God to guide our steps as we sing together, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah.
as we leave this time together know that we will be together again. And until that moment, may the love of God and the peace of Christ and the companionship of the Holy Spirit keep you safe and well. Amen.